Sansara. For a long time Siddhartha had lived the life of the world and of lust, though without being a part of it. His senses, which he had killed off in hot years as a Samana, had awoken again. He had tasted riches, had tasted lust, had tasted power. Nevertheless, he had still remained in his heart for a long time, a Samana. Kamala, being smart, had realized this quite right. It was still the art of thinking, of waiting, of fasting, which guided his life. Still the people of the world, the childlike people, had remained alien to him as he was alien to them. Years passed by. Surrounded by the good life, Siddhartha hardly felt them fading away. He had become rich. For quite a while he possessed a house of his own, and his own servants, and a garden before the city by the river. The people liked him. They came to him whenever they needed money or advice. But there was nobody close to him, except Kamala. That high, bright state of being awake, which he had experienced that one time at the height of his youth, in those days after Gotama's sermon, after the separation from Govinda, that tense expectation, that proud state of standing alone without teachings and without teachers, that supple willingness to listen to the divine voice in his own heart, had slowly become a memory, had been fleeting. Distant and quiet, the holy source murmured, which used to be near, which used to murmur within himself. Nevertheless, many things he had learned from the Samanas, he had learned from Gautama, he had learned from his father, the Brahman, had remained within him for a long time afterwards. Moderate living, joy of thinking, hours of meditation, secret knowledge of the self, of his eternal entity, which is neither body nor consciousness. Many a part of this he still had, but one part after another had been submerged and had gathered dust. Just as a potter's wheel, once it has been set in motion, will keep on turning for a long time, and only slowly lose its vigor and come to a stop. Thus Siddhartha's soul had kept on turning the wheel of asceticism, the wheel of thinking, the wheel of differentiation for a long time, still turning, but it turned slowly and hesitantly, and was close to coming to a standstill. Slowly, like humidity entering the dying stem of a tree, filling it slowly and making it rot. The world and sloth had entered Siddhartha's soul. Slowly it filled his soul, made it heavy, made it tired, put it to sleep. On the other hand, his senses had become alive. There was much they had learned, much they had experienced. Siddhartha had learned to trade, to use his power over people, to enjoy himself with a woman. He had learned to wear beautiful clothes, to give orders to servants, to bathe in perfumed waters. He had learned to eat tenderly and carefully prepared food, even fish, even meat and poultry, spices and sweets, and to drink wine, which causes sloth and forgetfulness. He had learned to play with dice and on a chessboard, to watch dancing girls, to have himself carried about in a sedan chair, to sleep on a soft bed. But still he had felt different from and superior to the others. Always he had watched them with some mockery, some mocking disdain. With the same disdain which a Samana constantly feels for the people of the world. When Kamaswami was ailing, when he was annoyed, when he felt insulted, when he was vexed by his worries as a merchant, Siddhartha had always watched it with mockery. Just slowly and imperceptibly, as the harvest seasons and rainy seasons passed by, his mockery had become more tired, his superiority had become more quiet. Just slowly, among his growing riches, Siddhartha had assumed something of the childlike people's ways for himself, something of their childlikeness and of their fearfulness. And yet, he envied them, envied them just the more the more similar he became to them. He envied them for the one thing that was missing from him and that they had, the importance they were able to attach to their lives, the amount of passion in their joys and fears. 
the fearful but sweet happiness of being constantly in love. These people were all of the time in love with themselves, with women, with their children, with honors or money, with plans or hopes. But he did not learn this from them. This out of all things, this joy of a child, and this foolishness of a child. He learned from them out of all things the unpleasant ones, which he himself despised. It happened more and more often that, in the morning after having had company the night before, he stayed in bed for a long time, felt unable to think and tired. It happened that he became angry and impatient when Kamaswami bored him with his worries. It happened that he laughed just too loud when he lost a game of dice. His face was still smarter and more spiritual than others, but it rarely laughed and assumed one after another those features which are so often found in the faces of rich people, those features of discontent, of sickliness, of ill humor, of sloth, of a lack of love. Slowly the disease of the soul which rich people have grabbed hold of him. Like a veil, like a thin mist, tiredness came over Siddhartha, slowly, getting a bit denser every day, a bit murkier every month, a bit heavier every year. As a new dress becomes old in time, loses its beautiful color in time, gets stains, gets wrinkles, gets worn off at the seams, and starts to show threadbare spots here and there, thus Siddhartha's new life, which he had started after his separation from Govinda, had grown old, lost color and splendor as the years passed by, was gathering wrinkles and stains, and hidden at bottom, already showing its ugliness here and there, disappointment and disgust were waiting. Siddhartha did not notice it. He only noticed that this bright and reliable voice inside of him, which had awoken in him at that time, and had ever guided him in his best times, had become silent. He had been captured by the world, by lust, covetousness, sloth, and finally also by that vice which he had used to despise and mock the most as the most foolish one of all vices, greed. Property, possessions and riches also had finally captured him. They were no longer a game and trifles to him, had become a shackle and a burden. In a strange and devious way, Siddhartha had gotten into this final and most base of all dependencies by means of the game of dice. It was since that time, when he had stopped being a samana in his heart, that Siddhartha began to play the game for money and precious things, which he at other times only joined with a smile, and casually as a custom of the childlike people, with an increasing rage and passion. He was a feared gambler, few dared to take him on, so high and audacious were his stakes. He played the game due to a pain of his heart, losing and wasting his wretched money in the game, brought him an angry joy. In no other way he could demonstrate his disdain for wealth, the merchant's false god, more clearly and more mockingly. Thus he gambled with high stakes and mercilessly, hating himself, mocking himself, won thousands, threw away thousands, lost money, lost jewelry, lost a house in the country, won again, lost again. That fear, that terrible and petrifying fear, which he felt while he was rolling the dice, while he was worried about losing high stakes, that fear he loved and sought to always renew it, always increase it, always get it to a slightly higher level. For in this feeling alone, he still felt something like happiness, something like an intoxication, something like an elevated form of life in the midst of his saturated, lukewarm, dull life. And after each big loss, his mind was set on new riches, pursued the trade more zealously, forced his debtors more strictly to pay, because he wanted to continue gambling, he wanted to continue squandering, continue demonstrating his disdain of wealth. Siddhartha lost his calmness when losses occurred, lost his patience when he was not paid on time, lost his kindness towards beggars, lost his disposition for giving away and loaning money to those who petitioned him. He, who gambled away tens of thousands at one roll of the dice and laughed at it, became more strict and more petty in his business. 
occasionally dreaming at night about money. And whenever he woke up from this ugly spell, whenever he found his face in the mirror at the bedroom's wall to have aged and become more ugly, whenever embarrassment and disgust came over him, he continued fleeing, fleeing into a new game, fleeing into a numbing of his mind brought on by sex, by wine, and from there he fled back into the urge to pile up and obtain possessions. In this pointless cycle he ran, growing tired, growing old, growing ill. Then the time came when a dream warned him. He had spent the hours of the evening with Kamala, in her beautiful pleasure garden. They had been sitting under the trees, talking, and Kamala had said thoughtful words, words behind which a sadness and tiredness lay hidden. She had asked him to tell her about Gotama, and could not hear enough of him, how clear his eyes, how still and beautiful his mouth, how kind his smile, how peaceful his walk had been. For a long time he had to tell her about the exalted Buddha, and Kamala had sighed and had said, One day, perhaps soon, I'll also follow that Buddha. I'll give him my pleasure garden for a gift, and take my refuge in his teachings. But after this, she had aroused him, and had tied him to her in the act of making love with painful fervor, biting and in tears, as if once more she wanted to squeeze the last sweet drop out of this vain, fleeting pleasure. Never before it had become so strangely clear to Siddhartha how closely lust was akin to death. Then he had lain by her side, and Kamala's face had been close to him, and under her eyes, and next to the corners of her mouth, he had, as clearly as never before, read a fearful inscription, an inscription of small lines, of slight grooves, an inscription reminiscent of autumn and old age, just as Siddhartha himself, who was only in his forties, had already noticed here and there grey hairs among his black ones. Tiredness was written on Kamala's beautiful face, tiredness from walking a long path, which has no happy destination, tiredness and the beginning of withering, and concealed, still unsaid, perhaps not even conscious anxiety, Fear of old age, fear of the autumn, fear of having to die. With a sigh, he had bid his farewell to her, the soul full of reluctance and full of concealed anxiety. Then Siddhartha had spent the night in his house with dancing girls and wine, had acted as if he was superior to them, towards the fellow members of his caste, though this was no longer true, had drunk much wine and gone to bed a long time after midnight being tired and yet excited, close to weeping and despair, and had for a long time sought to sleep in vain, his heart full of misery which he thought he could not bear any longer, full of a disgust which he felt penetrating his entire body like the lukewarm, repulsive taste of the wine, the just-too-sweet, dull music, the just-too-soft smile of the dancing girls, the just-too-sweet scent of their hair and breasts. But more than by anything else, he was disgusted by himself, by his perfumed hair, by the smell of wine from his mouth, by the flabby tiredness and listlessness of his skin. Like when someone who has eaten and drunk far too much vomits it back up again with agonizing pain, and is nevertheless glad about the relief. Thus this sleepless man wished to free himself of these pleasures, these habits, and all of this pointless life and himself in an immense burst of disgust. Not until the light of the morning and the beginning of the first activities in the street before his city house, he had slightly fallen asleep, had found for a few moments a half-unconsciousness, a hint of sleep. In those moments, he had a dream. Kamala owned a small, rare singing bird in a golden cage. Of this bird, he dreamt. He dreamt. This bird had become mute, who at other times always used to sing in the morning, and since this arose his attention, he stepped in front of the cage and looked inside. There the small bird was dead and lay stiff on the ground. He took it out, weighed it for a moment in his hand, and then threw it away, out in the street, and in the same moment he felt terribly shocked, and his heart hurt 
as if he had thrown away from himself all value and everything good by throwing out this dead bird. Starting up from this dream, he felt encompassed by a deep sadness. Worthless, so it seemed to him. Worthless and pointless was the way he had been going through life. Nothing which was alive, nothing which was in some way delicious or worth keeping, he had left in his hands. Alone he stood there, and empty like a castaway on the shore. With a gloomy mind, Siddhartha went to the pleasure garden he owned, locked the gate, sat down under a mango tree, felt death in his heart and horror in his chest, sat and sensed how everything died in him, withered in him, came to an end in him. By and by he gathered his thoughts, and in his mind he once again went the entire path of his life, starting with the first days he could remember. When was there ever a time when he had experienced happiness, felt a true bliss? Oh yes, several times he had experienced such a thing. In his years as a boy, he had had a taste of it. When he had obtained praise from the Brahmins, he had felt it in his heart. There is a path in front of the one who has distinguished himself in the recitation of the holy verses, in the dispute with the learned ones, as an assistant in the offerings. Then he had felt it in his heart. There is a path in front of you. You are destined for. The gods are awaiting you. And again, as a young man, when the ever-rising, upward-fleeing goal of all thinking had ripped him out of and up from the multitude of those seeking the same goal, when he wrestled in pain for the purpose of Brahman, when every obtained knowledge only kindled new thirst in him, then again he had, in the midst of the thirst, in the midst of the pain, felt this very same thing. Go on, go on, you are called upon. He had heard this voice when he had left his home, and had chosen the life of a Samana, and again when he had gone away from the Samanas to that perfected one, and also when he had gone away from him to the uncertain. For how long had he not heard this voice any more? For how long had he reached no height any more? How even and dull was the manner in which his path had passed through life, for many long years, without a high goal, without thirst, without elevation, content with small lustful pleasures, and yet never satisfied. For all of these many years, without knowing it himself, he had tried hard, and longed to become a man like those many, like those children, and in all this his life had been much more miserable and poorer than theirs, and their goals were not his, nor their worries. After all, that entire world of the Kamaswami people had only been a game to him, a dance he would watch, a comedy. Only Kamala had been dear, had been valuable to him, but was she still thus? Did he still need her, or she him? Did they not play a game without an ending? Was it necessary to live for this? No, it was not necessary. The name of this game was Sansara, a game for children, a game which was perhaps enjoyable to play once, twice, ten times, but forever and ever over again. Then Siddhartha knew that the game was over, that he could not play it any more. Shivers ran over his body, inside of him. So he felt something had died. That entire day he sat under the mango tree, thinking of his father, thinking of Govinda, thinking of Gotama. Did he have to leave them to become a Kamaswami? He still sat there when the night had fallen. When looking up he caught sight of the stars, he thought, Here I'm sitting under my mango tree, in my pleasure garden. He smiled a little. Was it really necessary? Was it right? Was it not his foolish game, that he owned a mango tree, that he owned a garden? He also put an end to this. This also died in him. He rose, bid his farewell to the mango tree, his farewell to the pleasure garden. Since he had been without food this day, he felt strong hunger, and thought of his house in the city, of his chamber and bed, of the table with the meals on it. He smiled tiredly, shook himself, 
and bid his farewell to these things. In the same hour of the night, Siddhartha left his garden, left the city, and never came back. For a long time, Kamaswami had people look for him, thinking that he had fallen into the hands of robbers. Kamala had no one look for him. When she was told that Siddhartha had disappeared, she was not astonished. Did she not always expect it? Was he not a Samana, a man who was at home nowhere, a pilgrim? And most of all, she had felt this the last time they had been together, and she was happy, in spite of all the pain of the loss, that she had pulled him so affectionately to her heart for this last time, that she had felt one more time to be so completely possessed and penetrated by him. When she received the first news of Siddhartha's disappearance, she went to the window, where she held a rare singing bird captive in a golden cage. She opened the door of the cage, took the bird out, and let it fly. For a long time she gazed after it, the flying bird. From this day on, she received no more visitors and kept her house locked. But after some time, she became aware that she was pregnant from the last time she was together with Siddhartha. By the river. Siddhartha walked through the forest, was already far from the city, and knew nothing but that one thing, that there was no going back for him, that this life, as he had lived it for many years until now, was over and done away with, and that he had tasted all of it, sucked everything out of it until he was disgusted with it. Dead was the singing bird he had dreamt of. Dead was the bird in his heart. Deeply, he had been entangled in sansara. He had sucked up disgust and death from all sides into his body, like a sponge sucks up water until it is full. And full he was, full of the feeling of being sick of it, full of misery, full of death. There was nothing left in this world which could have attracted him, given him joy, given him comfort. Passionately, he wished to know nothing about himself anymore, to have rest, to be dead. If there only was a lightning bolt to strike him dead, if there only was a tiger to devour him, if there only was a wine, a poison which would numb his senses, bring him forgetfulness and sleep, and no awakening from that. Was there still any kind of filth he had not soiled himself with? A sin or foolish act he had not committed? A dreariness of the soul he had not brought upon himself? Was it still at all possible to be alive? Was it possible to breathe in again and again? To breathe out? To feel hunger? To eat again? To sleep again? To sleep with a woman again? Was this cycle not exhausted? and brought to a conclusion for him. Siddhartha reached the large river in the forest, the same river over which a long time ago, when he had still been a young man and came from the town of Gotama, a ferryman had conducted him. By this river he stopped. Hesitantly he stood at the bank. Tiredness and hunger had weakened him, and whatever for should he walk on? Wherever to? To which goal? No. There were no more goals. There was nothing left but the deep, painful yearning to shake off this whole desolate dream, to spit out this stale wine, to put an end to this miserable and shameful life. A hang bent over the bank of the river, a coconut tree. Siddhartha leaned against its trunk with his shoulder, embraced the trunk with one arm, and looked down into the green water which ran and ran under him, looked down and found himself to be entirely filled with the wish to let go and to drown in these waters. A frightening emptiness was reflected back at him by the water, answering to the terrible emptiness in his soul. Yes, he had reached the end. There was nothing left for him except to annihilate himself, except to smash the failure into which he had shaped his life, to throw it away, before the feet of mockingly laughing gods. This was the great vomiting he had longed for, death, the smashing to bits of the form he hated. Let him be food for fishes, this dog Siddhartha, this lunatic, this depraved and rotten body, 
this weakened and abused soul. Let him be food for fishes and crocodiles. Let him be chopped to bits by the demons. With a distorted face, he stared into the water, saw the reflection of his face and spit at it. In deep tiredness, he took his arm away from the trunk of the tree and turned a bit, in order to let himself fall straight down, in order to finally drown. With his eyes closed, he slipped towards death. Then, out of remote areas of his soul, out of past times of his now weary life, a sound stirred up. It was a word, a syllable, which he, without thinking, with a slurred voice, spoke to himself, the old word which is the beginning and the end of all prayers of the Brahmins, the holy Om, which roughly means that what is perfect, or the completion. And in the moment when the sound of Om touched Siddhartha's ear, his dormant spirit suddenly woke up and realized the foolishness of his actions. Siddhartha was deeply shocked. So this was how things were with him, so doomed was he. So much he had lost his way and was forsaken by all knowledge, that he had been able to seek death. That this wish, this wish of a child, had been able to grow in him, to find rest by annihilating his body. What all agony of these recent times, all sobering realizations, all desperation had not brought about. This was brought on by this moment, when the Om entered his consciousness. He became aware of himself in his misery and in his error. Om, um, he spoke to himself. Om. Um. And again he knew about Brahman, knew about the indestructibility of life, knew about all that is divine which he had forgotten. But this was only a moment, flash. By the foot of the coconut tree, Siddhartha collapsed, struck down by tiredness, mumbling Om, placed his head on the root of the tree, and fell into a deep sleep. Deep was his sleep, and without dreams, for a long time he had not known such a sleep any more. When he woke up after many hours, he felt as if ten years had passed. He heard the water quietly flowing did not know where he was and who had brought him here, opened his eyes, saw with astonishment that there were trees and the sky above him, and he remembered where he was and how he got here. But it took him a long while for this, and the past seemed to him as if it had been covered by a veil, infinitely distant, infinitely far away, infinitely meaningless. He only knew that his previous life in the first moment when he thought about it, this past life seemed to him like a very old previous incarnation, like an early pre-birth of his present self, that his previous life had been abandoned by him, that full of disgust and wretchedness he had even intended to throw his life away, but that by a river under a coconut tree he had come to his senses, the holy word Om on his lips, that then he had fallen asleep, and had now woken up and was looking at the world as a new man. Quietly, he spoke the word Om to himself, speaking which he had fallen asleep, and it seemed to him as if his entire long sleep had been nothing but a long meditative recitation of Om, a thinking of Om, a submergence and complete entering into Om, into the nameless, the perfected. What a wonderful sleep had this been! Never before by sleep he had been thus refreshed, thus renewed, thus rejuvenated. Perhaps he had really died, had drowned, and was reborn in a new body. But no, he knew himself, he knew his hands and his feet, knew the place where he lay, knew this self in his chest, this Siddhartha, the eccentric, the weird one. But this Siddhartha was nevertheless transformed, was renewed, was strangely well-rested, strangely awake, joyful, and curious. Siddhartha straightened up. Then he saw a person sitting opposite to him, an unknown man, a monk in a yellow robe with a shaven head, sitting in the position of pondering. He observed the man, who had neither hair on his head nor a beard, and he had not observed him for long when he recognized this monk as Govinda, the friend of his youth. Govinda, 
who had taken his refuge with the exalted Buddha. Govinda had aged, he too, but still his face bore the same features, expressed zeal, faithfulness, searching, timidness. But when Govinda now, sensing his gaze, opened his eyes and looked at him, Siddhartha saw that Govinda did not recognize him. Govinda was happy to find him awake. Apparently, he had been sitting here for a long time and been waiting for him to wake up, though he did not know him. I have been sleeping, said Siddhartha. However, did you get here? You have been sleeping, answered Govinda. It is not good to be sleeping in such places, where snakes often are and the animals of the forest have their paths. I, O oh sir, am a follower of the exalted Gotama, the Buddha, the Sakyamuni, and have been on a pilgrimage together with several of us on this path, when I saw you lying and sleeping in a place where it is dangerous to sleep. Therefore I sought to wake you up, O oh sir, and since I saw that your sleep was very deep, I stayed behind from my group and sat with you. And then, so it seems, I have fallen asleep myself. I who wanted to guard your sleep. Badly, I have served you. Tiredness has overwhelmed me. But now that you're awake, let me go to catch up with my brothers. I thank you, Samana, for watching out over my sleep, spoke Siddhartha. You're friendly, you followers of the Exalted One. Now you may go then. I'm going, sir. May you, sir, always be in good health. I thank you, Samana. Govinda made the gesture of a salutation and said, Farewell. Farewell, Govinda, said Siddhartha. The monk stopped. Permit me to ask, sir, from where do you know my name? Now Siddhartha smiled. I know you, O Govinda, from your father's hut, and from the school of the Brahmins, and from the offerings, and from our walk to the Samanas and from that hour when you took your refuge with the Exalted One in the grove Jetavana. Your Siddhartha, Govinda exclaimed loudly. Now, I'm recognizing you, and don't comprehend any more how I couldn't recognize you right away. Be welcome, Siddhartha. My joy is great to see you again. It also gives me joy to see you again. You've been the guard of my sleep. Again, I thank you for this, though I wouldn't have required any guard. Where are you going to, O oh friend? I'm going nowhere. We monks are always traveling. Whenever it is not the rainy season, we always move from one place to another, live according to the rules of the teachings passed on to us, accept alms, move on. It is always like this. But you, Siddhartha, where are you going to? Quoth Siddhartha, With me too, friend. It is as it is with you. I'm going nowhere. I'm just traveling. I'm on a pilgrimage. Govinda spoke. You're saying you're on a pilgrimage, and I believe you. But forgive me, O Siddhartha. You do not look like a pilgrim. You're wearing a rich man's garments. You're wearing the shoes of a distinguished gentleman. And your hair with the fragrance of perfume, is not a pilgrim's hair, not the hair of a samana. Right so, my dear, you have observed well. Your keen eyes see everything. But I haven't said to you that I was a samana. I said, I'm on a pilgrimage, and so it is. I'm on a pilgrimage. You're on a pilgrimage, said Govinda. But few would go on a pilgrimage in such clothes, Few in such shoes, few with such hair. Never I have met such a pilgrim, being a pilgrim myself for many years. I believe you, my dear Govinda, but now, today, you've met a pilgrim just like this, wearing such shoes, such a garment. Remember, my dear, not eternal is the world of appearances, not eternal. Anything but eternal are our garments, and the style of our hair, and our hair and bodies themselves. I'm wearing a rich man's clothes. You've seen this quite right. I'm wearing them, because I have been a rich man. And I'm wearing my hair like the worldly and lustful people, for I have been one of them. And now, Siddhartha, what are you now? 
I don't know it. I don't know it just like you. I'm traveling. I was a rich man and am no rich man anymore. And what I'll be tomorrow, I don't know. You've lost your riches. I've lost them, or they me. They somehow happen to slip away from me. The wheel of physical manifestations is turning quickly, Govinda. Where is Siddhartha the Brahman? Where is Siddhartha the Samana? Where is Siddhartha the rich man? Non-eternal things change quickly, Govinda. You know it. Govinda looked at the friend of his youth for a long time, with doubt in his eyes. After that, he gave him the salutation which one would use on a gentleman and went on his way. With a smiling face, Siddhartha watched him leave. He loved him still, this faithful man, this fearful man. And how could he not have loved everybody and everything in this moment, in the glorious hour after his wonderful sleep, filled with Om? The enchantment, which had happened inside of him in his sleep and by means of the Om, was this very thing that he loved everything, that he was full of joyful love for everything he saw. And it was this very thing, so it seemed to him now, which had been his sickness before, that he was not able to love anybody or anything. With a smiling face, Siddhartha watched the leaving monk. The sleep had strengthened him much, but hunger gave him much pain, for by now he had not eaten for two days, and the times were long past when he had been tough against hunger. With sadness, and yet also with a smile, he thought of that time. In those days, so he remembered, he had boasted of three things to Kamala, had been able to do three noble and undefeatable feats, fasting, waiting, thinking. These had been his possessions, his power and strength, his solid staff. In the busy, laborious years of his youth, he had learned these three feats, nothing else. And now they had abandoned him, None of them was his any more, neither fasting, nor waiting, nor thinking. For the most wretched things, he had given them up, for what fades most quickly, for sensual lust, for the good life, for riches. His life had indeed been strange. And now, so it seemed, now he had really become a childlike person. Siddhartha thought about his situation. Thinking was hard on him, he did not really feel like it but he forced himself. Now, he thought, since all these most easily perishing things have slipped from me again, now I'm standing here under the sun again just as I have been standing here a little child. Nothing is mine. I have no abilities. There is nothing I could bring about. I have learned nothing. How wondrous is this? Now that I'm no longer young, that my hair is already half gray, that my strength is fading. Now I'm starting again at the beginning, and as a child. Again he had to smile. Yes, his fate had been strange. Things were going downhill with him, and now he was again facing the world void and naked and stupid. But he could not feel sad about this. No, he even felt a great urge to laugh. To laugh about himself. To laugh about this strange, foolish world. Things are going downhill with you, he said to himself, and laughed about it. And as he was saying it, he happened to glance at the river, and he also saw the river going downhill, always moving on downhill and singing and being happy through it all. He liked this well. Kindly he smiled at the river. Was this not the river in which he had intended to drown himself in past times, a hundred years ago? Or had he dreamed this? Wondrous indeed was my life, so he thought. Wondrous detours it has taken. As a boy, I had only to do with gods and offerings. As a youth, I had only to do with asceticism, with thinking and meditation, was searching for Brahman, worshipped the Eternal in the Atman. But as a young man, I followed the penitents, lived in the forest, suffered of heat and frost, learned to hunger, taught my body to become dead. Wonderfully, soon afterwards, insight came towards me in the form of the great Buddha's teachings. I felt the knowledge of the oneness of the world circling in me like my own blood. 
But I also had to leave Buddha and the great knowledge. I went and learned the art of love with Kamala, learned trading with Kamaswami, piled up money, wasted money, learned to love my stomach, learned to please my senses. I had to spend many years losing my spirit, to unlearn thinking again, to forget the oneness. Isn't it just as if I had turned slowly and on a long detour from a man into a child, from a thinker into a childlike person? And yet this path has been very good. And yet the bird in my chest has not died. But what a path has this been? I had to pass through so much stupidity, through so much vice, through so many errors, through so much disgust and disappointments and woe, just to become a child again and to be able to start over. But it was right so. My heart says yes to it. My eyes smile to it. I've had to experience despair. I've had to sink down to the most foolish one of all thoughts, to the thought of suicide, in order to be able to experience divine grace, to hear Om again, to be able to sleep properly and awake properly again. I had to become a fool to find Atman in me again. I had to sin to be able to live again. Where else might my path lead me to? It is foolish, this path. It moves in loops. Perhaps it is going around in a circle. Let it go as it likes. I want to take it. Wonderfully, he felt joy rolling like waves in his chest. Wherever from, he asked his heart, where from did you get this happiness? Might it come from that long good sleep, which has done me so good? Or from the word Om, which I said? Or from the fact that I have escaped, that I have completely fled, that I am finally free again, and am standing like a child under the sky? Oh, how good is it to have fled, to have become free. How clean and beautiful is the air here, how good to breathe. There, where I ran away from, there everything smelled of ointments, of spices, of wine, of excess, of sloth. How I hated this world of the rich, of those who revel in fine food, of the gamblers. How I hated myself for staying in this terrible world for so long. How I hated myself have deprived, poisoned, tortured myself, have made myself old and evil. No, never again I will, as I used to like doing so much, delude myself into thinking that Siddhartha was wise. But this one thing I have done well, this I like, this I must praise, that there is now an end to that hatred against myself, to that foolish and dreary life. I praise you, Siddhartha, after so many years of foolishness, you have once again had an idea, have done something, have heard the bird in your chest singing, and have followed it. Thus he praised himself, found joy in himself, listened curiously to his stomach, which was rumbling with hunger. He had now, so he felt, in these recent times and days, completely tasted and spit out, devoured up to the point of desperation and death, a piece of suffering, a piece of misery. Like this, it was good. For much longer, he could have stayed with Kamaswami, made money, wasted money, filled his stomach, and let his soul die of thirst. For much longer, he could have lived in this soft, well-upholstered hell, if this had not happened. The moment of complete hopelessness and despair, that most extreme moment when he hung over the rushing waters and was ready to destroy himself. That he had felt this despair, this deep disgust, and that he had not succumbed to it. That the bird, the joyful source and voice in him, was still alive after all. This was why he felt joy. This was why he laughed. This was why his face was smiling brightly under his hair, which had turned grey. It is good, he thought, to get a taste of everything for oneself, which one needs to know. That lust for the world and riches do not belong to the good things. I have already learned as a child. I have known it for a long time. But I have experienced only now. And now I know it. Don't just know it in my memory, but in my eyes, in my heart, in my stomach. 
good for me to know this. For a long time, he pondered his transformation, listened to the bird as it sang for joy. Had not this bird died in him? Had he not felt its death? No, something else from within him had died, something which already for a long time had yearned to die. Was it not this what he used to intend to kill in his ardent years as a penitent? Was this not his self, his small, frightened, and proud self he had wrestled with for so many years, which had defeated him again and again, which was back again after every killing, prohibited joy, felt fear? Was it not this, which today had finally come to its death, here in the forest, by this lovely river? Was it not due to this death that he was now like a child, so full of trust, so without fear, so full of joy. Now Siddhartha also got some idea of why he had fought this self in vain as a Brahmin, as a penitent. Too much knowledge had held him back, too many holy verses, too many sacrificial rules, too much self-castigation, so much doing and striving for that goal. Full of arrogance he had been, always the smartest, always working the most, always one step ahead of all others, always the knowing and spiritual one, always the priest or wise one. Into being a priest, into this arrogance, into this spirituality, his self had retreated, there it sat firmly and grew, while he thought he would kill it by fasting and penance. Now he saw it and saw that the secret voice had been right, that no teacher would ever have been able to bring about his salvation. Therefore he had to go out into the world, lose himself to lust and power, to woman and money, had to become a merchant, a dice gambler, a drinker, and a greedy person, until the priest and samana in him was dead. Therefore he had to continue bearing these ugly years, bearing the disgust, the teachings, the pointlessness of a dreary and wasted life up to the end, up to bitter despair until Siddhartha the lustful, Siddhartha the greedy, could also die. He had died. A new Siddhartha had woken up from the sleep. He would also grow old. He would also eventually have to die. Mortal was Siddhartha. Mortal was every physical form. But today he was young, was a child, the new Siddhartha, and was full of joy. He thought these thoughts, listened with a smile to his stomach, listened gratefully to a buzzing bee. Cheerfully he looked into the rushing river. Never before he had liked a water so well as this one. Never before he had perceived the voice and the parable of the moving water thus strongly and beautifully. It seemed to him as if the river had something special to tell him, something he did not know yet, which was still awaiting him. In this river, Siddhartha had intended to drown himself. In it, the old, tired, desperate Siddhartha had drowned today. But the new Siddhartha felt a deep love for this rushing water, and decided for himself not to leave it very